Um, yeah, I'll join in, join at the end at the end, 14031. I'd like to hear any feedback and views. I apologize for my voice. It doesn't hurt to talk, it's my sad point. Developing a PHP for about 10 years, master's in information systems, uh, senior software engineer, team lead, a great team, a few developers. That's fluctuated the size quite a bit, and QA. I'm working on occupational health screenings, this failure drug testing. Uh, it's amazing how complicated a simple drug test is. Um, Security wise, I have the SSCP, which is basically the child of the CISSP. If you remember that one, it's primarily it's the, one of the biggest ones for networking, sysadmins, etc. And the CSSLP, which is the software developer equivalent of the CSSP. I've also written exam questions for this SSCP, so if I take that exam, you may have my questions. Make uh, the PHP databases and JavaScript. Love being outdoors. I live here in Utah County. Love heading up to canyons all the time. Something outside. So the networks were network connections. We're working up here, so not to worry about for this. But uh, again, we're always under attack. There's always stuff happening. These, you know, the sources can be constant. They're targeting organizations. People are going after the money. They want to be able to uh, get your information, get your data, figure out what's going on. Um, use your servers to then send out other things like just you know, service attacks, etc. And some people just want to blow stuff up. And they just want to blow stuff up. They want to be we, awesome. We fielded a few of those people that were trying to just break in and just trash our database. Rather pathetic attempts, but so yes. it's like they, they would have just destroyed all our data. Yeah. They wouldn't have grabbed it for anything. It was malicious intent. Sometimes I think it's fun. Sometimes it's for fame. Sometimes I think it's you know, notable. The sources are script kiddies. Uh, people who don't really know what they're doing, they're just throwing it out. They're not going to be using any sort of way hide themselves or mask themselves, they're just going to be out there throwing things around. Um, collectives, uh, most famous of course be anonymous. Um, hopefully you're not in a situation where they can't guess you because they're a big problem. Um, nation state, you know, the uh, recent news about North Korea, China's a constant war with the United States, uh, Russia as well, other Eastern uh, European countries. These are constant attacks. This is some serious stuff. It's crazy. It's going on all the time. It's uh, constant. It's heavy. Crackers, thieves, colleagues might be the person sitting next to you. It might be your boss. It might be someone that just got hired in a call center. Um, creative users. The user hits a URL. They say, hey, I can change my user ID at the top, right? Yeah, problem. Many, many more. I once took help, I should say, took it down. I helped take down the university applicator enterprise system once. I was running a report at the time I was supposed to be running it. Someone else was running a report, but they weren't supposed to be running it. And next thing you know, the banner system goes down. Yeah. So it may not be intentional, maybe. You may think you have, you're not running something important. Maybe you're just running road signs, right? Caution zombies ahead. Raptors ahead. Snowden is a hero. He's got a basic easy to hack. Um, if you haven't been known to be a, a hack center to do the little key lock thing, it's actually really cool. I'll try it out. See if you can get past the first few levels. I was just spent a couple hours down already. Um, but basically, what they did here is they, they broke into the boxes with the, I don't know how they got in. Picks are easy. The default password was on. The other tag is pretty easy to get the right tools. Default passwords, boom, they're in. So you may not think your application is important. You may think it's not going to be attacked. But no matter what it is, it's going to be attacked if it's accessible. <clears throat> so notable attacks. We're going over these just to make sure we understand this. This is going to be your application. If it isn't already, it will be soon. Um, target, of course, depot. Big interesting one is some pictures. The concept is that it's, people believe it's North Korea, I guess it's not officially confirmed. But you, know, you have a nation state going and basically taking all the data they can find from, from a company, organization, major use corporation. Anthem, JP Morgan, eBay, 
remember when the <coughs> light was down on Christmas. Um, uh, there was all these kind of things that were going on. We're going to bring it home here. No, guys, right? You have bitcoins. It's a PHP shop. What's that? As if you, the code is posted online. You go looking for code now. There's some problems with it. There's some problems with the administration. It has some business issues. It has some coding issues. Uh, Drupal, remember PHP.net in the end of the morning and uh, Chrome said, hey, the search is not good or whatever it was. It was last year. Uh, Facebook was oh, Slack. Recently, Slack, GitHub. They've all had problems. Some of them have been major, some of them have been kind of minor. Um, for example, Slack was the usernames. Remember, you used to be able to enter the domain first and you see the groups or something like that. So, this is my idea. This is my thoughts going. Uh, what version of PHP are you using? We're going to talk for very basic. What version of PHP are you using? Anthony Ferreira, he has a blog posted in December. Uh, basically, there's only about 10 versions of PHP at that time that were not, that didn't have known security issues. Everything else was. So that ended up being about 25% of all PHP sites were vulnerable with known security issues. So it's a very basic thing. They're bad. That's one of the easiest things to address. Uh, make sure you're using the current version. And these slides are posted up on JoinedIn. Uh, you can go to reference them, watch them on SlideShare as well. If you get that URL. If you go read that article, it's really good. Uh, Especially the older version of PHP is most of them are hacked or have security issues that have been patched. So make sure you check your version, see if there's any security patches that you can apply and go put those on. Significantly help with uh, that first issue if people are going out finding out with the PHP version and uh, it's vulnerable or sorry, with a known attack. Again, no organizations you know what you're doing. May seem simple, may not. So we're going to cover SQL injection. That's probably the most basic. It's also the most fun. Um, there's code up on GitHub. You can pull it down. Just go change the configuration to your old, to your MySQL server. In this case, there's a little script you can install it, and you can do you can start doing your SQL injection attacks. We'll look at later here too. Um, to see how that works and what's involved with the SQL injection attack. Cross-site scripting. This one initially on the surface doesn't seem very significant. If you start delving deeper and deeper into it, it causes major problems. We'll get to uh, authentication, authorization, the difference between the two, some practices you should be doing, data validation, what it is and why it's important, and then data integrity. Uh, the two data ones are a little bit different than the rest. They're not things you didn't really think about, but they are security related. So, like, so the classic SQL injection, if you have a query, select star from users where ID equals dollar sign ID. You go run that. Someone goes and says, hey, what if I did update user set enabled equals one because my buddy's logged out and can't get in. If you're not doing any data checks, that could go and execute. Select star from users where user ID equals 15 and will update the users and enable all. Then you have all the users. You can think about other things that could happen. MySQL, perhaps you have, I can use MySQL. There's other databases, of course. MySQL is probably the heaviest user of PHP. Postgres is a really good option, I would argue. Um, you know, you have anything. But we'll use generally speaking, generally speaking MySQL. Then MySQL, you can go and do um, show databases. Also, the databases are listed. You say, okay, show tables in the database. And all the tables you must have to say, show create table X, and then you have the table structure. <laughs> you can get all the data, know, find out all the users, find all these things, get that user's not locked down, just using SQL injection. I have just one SQL injection, your entire database, not just your database, but your server architecture is exposed. Major problem. <laughs> Important to watch out for that one. We'll get into uh, how do you scrub the data, filter the data, prepare it. One of the biggest things you can do, though, is use this is an example maybe like a framework, like a framework or Symphony or whatever, whatever you're using. 
maybe using the only uh, place you can run CLI, and you're using PO, whatever you're using, each one has their own way of doing this. Generally speaking, it's something like select from table. Usually there's like a prepare, a bind, and a uh, execute. Execute, thank you. Execute and then fetch all and close the common ones. You can go and use the bind and you'll go and escape the data, make sure it's safe to use this query. In this case, it's gonna put uh, ID is only gonna be used there. So in the case where you had the colon, it's not gonna work, right? It's, it's gonna it's gonna wrap that all in a single quote. It's not gonna be able to update those. It's not gonna see a separate query because it's gonna be escaped out. Important to go use the features that are available. People have figured this problem out a million times. Um, use the queries when you prepare statements. Um, Shouldn't be doing that. Especially if that thing comes from like a, like a cookie or a post or get or put or get, delete whatever's coming from. It was very important to properly use the, use the prepared statement rather than the person for the query. Another example, maybe they want to go and set the cost to a penny for everything. Now everything's set to a penny, right? And, or you could flip it to be negative, and all of a sudden you get paid to buy something. <laughs> that would be a major problem. They could do it covertly by submitting it maybe once or twice a week, and they could go and change the amounts. They're going to start siphoning money off until they get found. So, that's, that's another example where you could lose money from SQL injection. Again, solution, update. In this case, you're binding by B to the value. Um, there's more to this, but we'll get to data validation. That's going to be part of it. So validate it so that if you're looking for a cost, that a cost is sent down, not just you know, something else that you can do other malicious items. If you're looking for an integer, Make sure it's integer, not a string. Make sure it's actually an integer that matches up. And use a prepared statement. Consider the misuses. Use the misuses. We talked about you know, maybe they want to get the money. Maybe they want to find out the database structure. Maybe they want to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, SQL injection is the easiest way to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. Give those the code samples on GitHub. If you use that, you can go and change the, you, the Git parameters, and you can start seeing the data structure. Fun to, fun to um, data validation, and if you, you know, ensure the data type is correct, <coughs> use the table for database features where applicable. Some databases are better at these other things. There are some things than others. Views, I generally, my SQL views are difficult because they're not scalable. Um, but if it's applicable, they're useful. Um, so that's the kind of thing, you have to kind of know things like that. If you're most aggressive, that's going to handle view index is much better. Uh, store procedures are going to be very fast for, uh, generally you don't put business logic in them for our other ways, but generally speaking, you keep the business logic in the, in the object oriented code, and you do the, the data crunching inside the store procedures or functions. Call them table expression for available. That's something that's not my SQL, but it's going to be Postgres, the same server, and others. Use these features where available. Avoid those missteps. Uh, they can also be much faster than what you're doing. The sites will look faster, more, more stable. So. Any questions about SQL injections? So, we had a, a presentation yesterday where someone was pointing out with the prepared, at least with PDO, you couldn't parameterize, like maybe your. Well, Someone was asking tables, I don't know if we do that, but what about like order by or some of the columns? Do, do most of them support you being able to do those in prepared statements? Yes, yeah, so usually you'll have a separate method called you know, the order or um, limit or whatever. You'll have you know, the other things you pass in. So you have a select, an update, and all those other things you can on. You can also do expressions, you can also you need to do group and cat this and that and that. You can also do those kind of things, a little bit different. So there are those that are available um, in each app. It'll, each frame can be a little bit different. They all have available as far as we Just as some feedback, I, I, uh, I did something custom to solve that issue. 
where it like <coughs> order by parameters or whatever. Um, and basically, I, I provided an array of op basically I sanitized the data before it, I even tried to put it in. So you you check like it if it is an array of valid columns. Yeah, yeah, that's that was my. And then if it if it matched, then I grabbed the array, not the value through. that was input. You know. Yeah. So. You get the data validation we're going to check, make sure it's an array or an you know, available option as well. Yeah. Cross site scripting, pro source. Any other questions about SQL injection? Yeah, those are the most probably common. Um, if you go look up, if you go Google SQL injection list, the list sites, you can find hundreds of sites that have SQL injections available. You click on the link and you just go do the SQL injection. So, Make sure your site's not on there. <laughs> <laughs> but literally, you can go look up the list, and they'll just list them all out. And then look them. They're actually exposed, running, showing all their data. Super awesome. <coughs> Cross-site scripting is another form of code injection, similar to SQL injection. In this case, it's going to be onto the client-side code, generally speaking. The attacker is going to attacker is going to the client-side script. Uh, it may be JavaScript, it's most common, maybe just an owl, might be something silly, maybe they'll throw a marquee in there, just to be cool. Uh, in the pre-production environment, we had a, a grid that had uh, a choice of data that had been, uh, had been scripted. It was allowing HTML tags, because the data generally needed to have that. Um, and so someone thought it was funny, well the testers thought it was funny, they put a bunch of bouncing marquees in, so you went to the data grid, and now things bouncing all over the place. <laughs> that was fun. So <clears throat> keep in mind the data. So is this, I'm, I'm not completely clear on, on what this is. Is this basically somebody opens the console and puts a bunch of code that, on their own? I mean, does that only affect their own machine anyway? Or? That, that, that'll get to the uh, persistent versus reflected. So okay. This is going to be, here's an example. So let's say they said admit in the form, um, window to allocation, they're going to send you to the YouTube video because they get paid for every time they go to visit. So maybe on their form, maybe on Facebook, they're going to go hook it in, and all of a sudden you get all these hits because they haven't turned in there. Um, that would be uh, an example when it might be used. Uh, more malicious would perhaps be, they go throw in bats up site.com slash till data.js, and maybe they use that to send the cookies off to your server. And if you're using cookies for validation, and get to the application. Um, maybe they're using it to launch a denial of service attack, a distributed denial of service to the US. Um, you know, maybe they're, they're going and throwing it on, throwing a bunch of JavaScript so that whenever that person is moving around, that JavaScript can go and send off requests to specific sites or try to know sites. Uh, start to become much more malicious at that point. The trust between the server, the server the client, and the server is gone. Again, yeah, I'm, I'm with them. Uh, so it's, they put this in my form, and then when I go to view the data that was submitted in my form, I'm going to end up running their code. Is that the idea? Yes. Okay. That's the most common. There's many others. If you look at all those OWASP website, um, they have a list of it's like a few hundred examples of possible ones. That's all sorts, anything from you know alerting to redirecting to all sorts of things. But it's generally speaking, it's a JavaScript exploits. I guess my question is then, how do they put that in my form, you know? Um, so we go back to the persistent versus reflective. So persistent is going to be you submitted the form, you didn't validate the data, you didn't filter the data, you went to your database, you save it, and, and then when another user comes by to view that page, maybe they posted a blog or something. Or something. Um, the script tag is going to be hidden, and they're going to download that JavaScript to their browser. That JavaScript can be executed. So also you have someone that's making JavaScript be executed on one box. That's a common route of the state. Oh, okay. So and instead of like SQL injection, they're injecting JavaScript to yeah, save yeah. it to your database. Yeah, and any clients that go with generates JavaScript, the vast majority. Of um, JavaScript and HTML is usually what it is. It has making you know, I can make my JavaScript run in your box because you went to my website. And that's where the problem comes in. And then, of course, your customers start seeing this kind of thing. Maybe they're going to slow the box down, get redirected to from your site somewhere else. They're losing business, customers run away, they get annoyed by it, whatever. Um, 
persistent is going to be where uh, the store the database is persistent. Keep going. Reflected. Um, Reflect is going to be uh, something where maybe someone sends an email to you, say, "Hey, click on this link to get this super awesome product," and you know it has the URL, and that URL maybe the Git parameters has some malicious stuff, or maybe it goes to a site that's their own site that it throws some JavaScript on, pulls your cookies, and sends them off to the other site, and something like that, or redirects it, grabs your cookies first, and moves on. It can be the persistent that is perhaps more dangerous, but for reflect to be bad as well. Um, yeah, it can be on the browser, maybe it's an email, click a link, whatever. Uh, lots of sources there. Uh, to prevent cross-site scripting, uh, what I'm speaking is called filter the input, escape the output, escape the view. So PHP has built-in filter input. Um, Rasmus HP recommends using that. This would be uh, filtering the content. There's all sorts of there's filter on the integers. Uh, so you can type in a string and enter a few integers. You go to the filter. It'll take out every but the integers. There's an email one. It'll take out every character. It's not valid for emails. If it's not going to validate that's email format. It'll take out the characters that are not allowed based on what you said it was. So if you want to make sure that they actually submitted an integer, you want to do like maybe a string comparison and say, is the string value of this one equal to the output of that filter input? So you said that we would escape the data, so would we do that before it hits the database? That would be the best time to do it. Yeah, so then you'd filter the input before it goes in the database, mm -hmm. and then when you're sending it back out, you would escape it then. Yeah. Maybe it's, you, know, you want to, let's say they want to be able to show a, the tag, you don't want the tag to show up, but you don't necessarily want it to do stuff. You don't want to do the marquee, for example, or put a horizontal line or whatever you want to put on. I mean, you don't want to put a div in there. You might want to show div like, text wise on the screen. Because maybe it's a valid input. Maybe just, you know, just tag overflow. You want to be able to show that. But you don't want it to actually execute and do stuff. Yeah. So you can strip tags. Um, in, that, in that case, Filter, filter the input, make sure the data coming in is correct. Uh, we get to the authorization and allocation, we'll get to what data should be allowed, what should it as well. Because it's more than just, is it a number? It's, is that number accurate? Is it valuable? Is it correct? Is it access to the number? So we that. Um, I also generally remove unwanted characters. So if you go to the ASCII tables, they've got, you know, there's all these characters besides this alphabet letters and numbers, especially things. You always, you know, you want smiley faces showing up, you want paragraph signs, all these different things that maybe you don't want to have in terms of Maybe you do it's plus. Those are the things you can take out. You know, white list, say, hey, I want A through Z, lowercase, uppercase, and numbers. Maybe some alphabet. Uh, so remove unwanted characters. So. Any questions about cross-site scripting? Can you maybe just like, so they can't, um, they can't put like a JavaScript file or anything onto your site because of the, can you maybe clarify like the, the fact that if you're, I don't remember the name of that reference, but I asked you to explain it further, but you can take a JavaScript file and you can't put it, you can't like load a JavaScript file from one server into another unless they have like certain things in common, cores, you know, like the cores spec or whatever. Maybe that's not really what we're talking about, but I thought there was like something to do with SSL or something like that where JavaScript files won't load. Right, it was like an SSL site and I should have all referenced. Um, <clears throat> the examples back here, um, if they allow that, you could also put actual JavaScript in here. So it could, see, it could be script type equals JavaScript, and then you get a big block of JavaScript right there that does stuff. But if you're running, <coughs> Data to be, you know, log data to be stored. Maybe something simple like, you know, look at that location. Or maybe they're doing, you know, grabbing your cookie right there in that script. So it may, it may or may not be hosted on a different server. It might be in this case. It might just be raw JavaScript right there. Okay. Any other questions? Process 
So I've seen some, some uh, CMSs where they allow me to, to input a script tag with, with a bunch of JavaScript inside of it, you know, to, to right. do stuff. Is that is there any way around that not being secure? Like, is that definitely not secure anytime I could do that? Uh, it, it depends on how malicious your users are. Yeah. <laughs> And that's it, right? You know you don't want to trust your users. <laughs> yeah. You know, okay. It depends on what you do with the script, too, right? I mean, if, yeah. if they're never showing it or using it anywhere, I mean, it depends on what they do with it. Right. And how you, how you scrub it on the way out. Going back to this tech overflow, maybe it's useful. Maybe you want to be able to see JavaScript. I'm just not exit. It depends on what your purpose is. Yeah. And if you escape it if, when you put it, when you display it, you can can show it without running it. So, so I know us. I, I know that there are places where you can say, "Hey, this is going to be code or script," and so it doesn't <coughs> just try to reformat it. But if it's running it as a script, I, I don't know how you sanitize it. In terms yeah, of that's what I'm talking about. I've seen yeah. some CMSs where somebody's like, "Hey, I want my content to do this." I'm like, "Well, I'll just throw the script tag in your content block, you know, and it executes it." That's that's <laughs> so. There's no way that's safe, I is there? No. Bad people yeah. use my site. Yeah. Well, that yeah. Yeah. your users are, in that case are supposed to, you know, it's their site, and so hopefully they're not <laughs> sabotaging themselves. If you're, right. one. if you're giving someone who's not a user, you know, someone who owns the site. Yeah. Access, I mean, in that situation, true. they have to log in to get there. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. Well, yeah. Did you trust all the people? You trust your users not to be <laughs> malicious that way, I guess. Well, I guess they're not a, they're not anonymous. So if they do something bad, you'll know who they were, you know, yeah. as the owner, and then you can like I don't know, <laughs> them. I don't know, <laughs> slap their wrist, take them, but yeah, disable the login, talk about how they were obnoxious. I don't know. Yeah, disable the login so they catch a Facebook account. Well, that's the or maybe it's the job's <laughs> reviewed before it's posted. Maybe it goes into a queue and gets reviewed prior to it. Yeah. Any questions? Questions. Next section, authorization, authentication. So authentication, you, you know, the user is who they say they are. Is it actually Bob there knocking on the door trying to get an website? Authorization is the user has access to a specific resource. Can Bob go and edit users? You edit this user. Um, very, you know, sometimes you have to get too fast these two merging together. They're very different. See any issues here with the uh, session versus cookie? Or do you use a cookie? Cookies are very easy to get from the browser. Cookies stick. So you can go and change the cookie. In fact, uh, if you, has anyone done the capture the flag yet? Um, I, I didn't know this, but this is actually the answer to one of the questions. <laughs> okay. So, oh, I should say it's not user, it's user name, but that, that's an example of. Use a change in cookie. Cookies are very manipulative. You can change those, so you shouldn't be able to rely on cookies for authentication. Um, you shouldn't should use them in session. What about a what, what's it called? Like a remember me login. Remember me logins. You know what I'm talking about? Tokenization. So that you stay logged in through multiple. You leave. Sessions. You come back another right. day. You're still logged in, like Facebook. Well, part of it is I, I want to talk about this session versus cookie. Make sure I understand why it's secure, but I think it's related to that. Because with session, the session is linked back to a cookie on their browser, but it's some big long random string that nobody's going to guess, right? That's what makes it secure. So if I'm logged in as admin, and it expires. Um, well, not necessarily. Not if you do the remember me. Right. Well, I guess the yeah. session doesn't. Well, it, session it usually does. is, but, but the it remember but it expires in 30 days, say. You know, oh yeah, you have yeah. to come back and get a new cookie. So that I guess that's part of it. But if I do a remember me and I'm logged in as admin and somehow someone figures out what my big long cookie is, they're going to be able to get in. Right. So, yeah. And this okay. comes into this should, generally speaking, it shouldn't just be one session to authenticate one session variable. We should have multiple. For example, tokens being used a lot too. Yeah, different tokens, re, you know, expiring tokens, they expire every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, they get to a new token. You send in the session to check that as well. Um, the strongest 
going to be using a combination of both. So not just in the session for one user and have the token as well. But, uh, so if it's hashed, it's I mean, if you if you're gonna if you're gonna store a cookie uh, like a token as a cookie, if it's hashed, it's a little bit safer. I mean, is it considered safe? You know? <laughs> There's no binary. This is safe and this is not safe. Right? I'm not asking for 100 percent safe, but I'm asking for <laughs> best, you know, practice. best practice. <laughs> best practice. Yeah. What, what are you protecting? Are you protecting your Twitter account or your bank account? <laughs> yeah. The uh, if you send it over SSL, it's get, you know. Because yeah. if it's not SSL, they, they can grab your cookie yeah. anytime. And it right? only cracks at SSL in about 30 seconds, so it's <laughs> good. Yeah, there's some revelations. Uh, uh, authentication again, going back to that 7 or API format, API user 7, maybe you want to get that. Can they change that, get authorization to that user? Some of them can now. I would say session and tokens are generally the ideal combination of the two to thank users. Maybe I can go. It's a bit more of a burden, but if you refresh those tokens, it's a good, thing. It's a good way to have uh, it. Uh, again, don't trust the user. The data that changed by the user. Git, post, and I'll put really cookie, server, even, environment, even. You have to think of these are coming from your computer. People go change. Gets most cookies are by far the easiest. The server and others and stuff are a little bit harder, but they do it as well. Um, and this is the sessions and tokens use a combination of the two rather than just one. Automatic logouts, refreshing the tokens, make that tokens automatically expire. Auditing what's going on is going to help all these different things coming together to the best solution. Um, defense in depth is the common. When you say auditing, what are you auditing what a user is doing? Um, so you go back and say, hey, this user was the one that did this. <coughs> you know, be able to say, hey, uh, we can see that you're trying to log in this many times. Uh, automatically logging them out, take that audits. So, for example, applications are worked on. You audit every login attempt, the URL they hit, you know, if we had a login app, all these different things, all the things that they're doing are being audited. So you go back and say, it helps to track out bugs. It helps to be able to check the course, you know, do security audits, those sort of things. Um, the auditing is going to be different each application. You don't pick a database table or multiple database tables. Maybe you have a, you know, a state table of, for each table you have. So, like an example of that, I'm thinking is like when if I go to my bank and I fail login seven times, it says, I'm going to have to send you a text message with a special number to the phone you already gave me right. before I let you try anymore. Yep. Because I, I know what you were doing. You were trying to log in more than seven times, and now it's going to be back you, to you, you can't try to log in anymore until you do something else. Right. You lock your account, keep your account to you, and they go to their credit your interaction yourself. Right. Um, never assume that user is authorized. Always check it. Shouldn't have to say, oh, what's their in, they're in, right? It's too easy to find if you use them, unless you're using some page application, it's easy to figure out where else they're going to be at. Um, but then the user can figure out other like, points to come in and check the values from the user and make sure they're actually legitimate. Just some consideration. You know, can the user gain access to that personal identification information, PII? Is it sensitive data? Are there regulations on this? If it's a new site, you probably don't need to authenticate people. If you're using an application that has sensitive information, you say, well, again, you probably do. Um, major things like the user can't change the, the admin user. <coughs> Maybe they go and say, I'm going to change the admin user to have my email address. And they're going to go reset the password for the admin. And you know, all those kind of things going on. <laughs> but maybe you shouldn't have a user called admin because that's the most commonly guessed user. Admin, Don't yes. Admin, administrator. And demo. <laughs> demo, tech, yeah. Just make it admin bang. That totally makes it secure. Oh, right? oh yeah. 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 Make sure the user can escalate the privileges in this case. Make sure that they can admit the DOM or using the JavaScript variables to authenticate people. 
you need to go in there and change that Elvis scrub in their head. Um, you need to use SQL injection to get to something that they shouldn't be getting to. Um, go back to that user where you have the example again, select like star from users where ID equals one. They change that to more one equal one. Then they also have access to all the users. Um, users use cross site scripting. Users use detail templates. You have your error reporting turned on. If you have display errors turned on your PGI and files, hopefully not on production. Probably on dev, it's a good idea. But not on production. And on dev, you have your reporting turned all the way up. So you can see the notices and applications. Notice these things before they get up to production people have these issues. Any other questions about authentication, authorization? We can't go too deep into this. There's so much that you can know behind authorization, authentication. There's lots of different ways to implement this. Uh, these are some, kind of, some key factors to consider. Since we don't have time to get any further into it, can you at least point us to some other resources on where we can dive more? <coughs> yeah, OWASP has a great resource. Um, they have you know, different vulnerabilities, but they also have some information. Um, generally speaking, frameworks frame will have like a, the auth section, auth module. Um, you may have some ACL tables to you go and define the permissions and you know, some website. Users to groups and groups to permissions, the ACLs, access control lists, um, authorization. You got uh, OAuth, uh, OAuth 2, is the most busy current, I would recommend for looking at using tokens. There was a whole presentation last year, so you should be able to find it on, on the chat, on the conference's YouTube channel. That would just the whole thing was on authentication and authorization. Thank you. Um, data validation. Um, data, the definition is sure that your data is clean, useful, um, it's correct. Um, you know, why don't you check the data type? The integer, there's no color, the string, the date. You check this with regular expressions. Maybe you have, you know, the, the uh, if you have a string, you can get back the string's too long. Or maybe they send an the integer, you're sending in a bunch of characters. Um, check the data type. Very simple to check the data type. Cracker player, crack match is a very common one. If you're the person, the, as the saying goes, the, the developer has a, sees it, has a problem, they're going to use regular expressions to solve the problem, they'll have two problems. So they got to figure out how to use the regular expression. No. Um, I just look up, like, I try to find somebody who already did it for me. I never did it myself. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is one of my default to my, my, uh, one of my mentors. Yeah. Go online, Google it, whatever. That's one of my weaknesses. Cool. Figure out the, the regular expressions. Um, <coughs> check the range. You know, maybe it's a value on that cost example. Make sure they can't do negative values. Maybe there's a maximum value. The length. Maybe you know, if they want to enter um, a postal code and they're in the United States, make sure it's five digits. Make sure it's the correct length. Maybe there's a maximum database length of. 40 characters, it's bar car 40. Make sure it's no more than 40. You know, more than one, or more than five, whatever it is. Yeah, there, there are regular expressions posted on places like Stack Overflow for postal codes and phone numbers, and stuff like that. Because all phone numbers are all on the same format all over the world. Imagine, imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. And don't try to do the email one by yourself. <laughs> Emails are insanely difficult to do regular expression. It's doable, but they're amazingly difficult. So look them up. Use an existing one. Um, code validation allows for cross-reference the data. Make sure the data is useful. The database constraints will give more. Um, but the structure, make sure the structure is correct. Make sure the data type is correct. Make sure there's conditional requirements. If this, then you require that. Check those kind of things. Don't assume that live users can enter valid data. Put those checks down. Throw, throw exceptions or return false, whatever you do in your code, whatever your uh, practices you have your application. Um, data integrity is, is one that I'm, I'm a big proponent for. Uh, making sure that you have foreign keys on your database. Um, have you ever worked on a project, MySQL, there's been no foreign keys in relation to the what, what problems come up? Well, lots of problems. What hasn't? <laughs> All of a sudden, you have this data, 
that's in there and that's not references, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have these extra values that aren't ever used. The data size is big. You have the users are putting in bad data. There's no checks to make sure they put the correct data. All sorts of problems can come. Stability goes down. Um, use the foreign keys. They're there for a reason. If you're using, if you're using relational database, you say, um, it helps keep that data accurate. You can't go back, at the end of the day, you can't go back to your customer and tell them their data is accurate unless you have four keys there. Yes, you can have the PHP validate the data. You can do those checks, but you can't. The database provides that guarantee later. You need keys to that du data duplication. You don't want to have the same state in the list table twice. If you have a list of postal codes and codes, maybe you don't want to have the same code twice. Um, it helps avoid that data corruption and data loss. It helps with stability, performance-wise, fewer records, make better performance, uh, less cost to maintain the disk space, and so on. Um, usability, maintainability, by the databases, makes your code easier to maintain if you have normalization in the database. Um, getting a development life cycle, um, make sure that you take the time to get the requirements for security included in the stories, if you user stories, requirements, um, often the security issues are missing. Put a block on the issue. Say, hey, you need to know what's going to happen. What's the security risk? You know, what are you willing to accept from a risk standpoint? What are security considerations? <coughs> work with the project manager, business analyst, whoever you work with, wherever your architecture is, um, work with those to make sure we have requirements before we start jumping into some security standpoint. The selling point for customers and so on. Um, I find code reviews are extremely helpful to identify security issues because it's not, not something necessary you can automatically detect. Um, there are some tools out there that help do security auditing, but code reviews help from a professional standpoint. Uh, have some security testing acceptance. Um, regularly review the security side standpoint. You know, identify those weak spots. Um, and strengthen the weakness plots. Make sure that you know, if they're a, a value to work in those specific areas. Convincing management can be difficult because maybe they don't want to invest in security. Maybe they don't want to get into it. Avoid fear tactics. <laughs> uh, I'll try not to scare them. You know, the poor little bobby tables will... <laughs> enough little bobby tables will... You go to maybe real space. Avoid the fear tactics, explain the benefit, you know, brand value. You know, look at the company's been having some major strength, which is Target, Home Depot. You right after that you want them to target and be like, I'm gonna use cash today. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's security, there's money tied to that. Um, customer loyalty is a selling point. Uh, maybe there's regulations you need to be uh, following. Especially, you know, banking or personal information, socials, that kind of stuff. You're gonna have major issues you're not being compliant. Tens of thousands of medical records. It's on the news all the time. <laughs> Major problem. You know, get visibility and security. Your security posture. You know, explain, hey, we've got cross-site scripting exploits that are being run over here, or you know, maybe we, we need to go use you know, the new PHP password verified password hash functionality. Because um, we're using old MD5 as deprecated. People go look at rainbow tables and figure out their passwords. We need to go change that. We give some guys an idea of security posture. You know, are we doing things good or not? Um, set some plans, set some goals, and figure out what's going to work. Um, convincing the management to let you have time. Maybe they say, okay, we're going to give you 10% of your time to work on security issues for the next three months. You know, something like that. Tied to a value. So, you know, you can, you know, the cost of the breach is going to be a million dollars. But we can spend ten thousand dollars in development to fix the problem now. Not have to have that million dollar fine. So tie to the money, um, explain the benefit, and uh, increase the customer. But so how is that not a fear tactic? <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't find don't find Avoid approaching it to try and still fear. But saying we'll do this so you won't get have to pay millions of dollars. Well go to the point you know where it's you know, we have these two different, you know, we can either pay the million dollars or we pay the $10,000. Okay. We've got to choose the route, you know, tied to the money. Uh, 
don't go in there trying to bully them. <laughs> Give them good feelings first, and then tell them if you don't take this carrot, that someone's going to beat okay. you with a stick. <laughs> You gotta have the right tone, the right attitude going into talking. I, I just always feel like I'm in a fear tactic discussion yeah. whenever I have to talk about security with my superiors. Right. Yeah, it makes it hard. Yeah. Yeah, right? I think it's because I see them and I can see them like. Right. <laughs> so. No, that's just you personally that they're terrified. <laughs> I could be. I could be. I mean, I can misunderstand this thing too. A couple resources there. Any the slides are posted on Join In. They're also up on SlideShare. Um, that no, sorry, that list right there. This is the OWASP list of trusted scripting attacks. The cheat sheet. That's what the hundreds are. <laughs> what was that? Um, any questions? Again, we're a little bit over time. But, uh, some questions. Uh, any questions about security? Feel free to talk to me afterwards. Or, or, or discussion. Thanks, everyone.